friends once gave me this, uh, this, this line. He, he was just kind of describing himself to me, and he said, I'm, I'm just one of those guys that if you ask me what time it is, I'm going to tell you how the clock was made. Uh, it was just, it was his way of saying, like, I, I, love to, I love to tell stories. I love, to, I love to talk. I love to include all of the details, both the necessary and the unnecessary ones. And, and it's, I mean, we've all been in that conversation, right, with someone who is, who's, who's struggling to, like, grab a hold of what are really unnecessary details. Like, I'm very guilty of this. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a Thursday, I think. Yeah, in, in 2012, it was a Thursday in 2000, no, 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 it was a Wednesday. It was a Wednesday, and it was in 2013. Nobody cares. <laughs> well, Today, we're, we're in our third week of this series, The, the Comeback Kid, and we're talking about Joseph's life. We're, we're learning from his resilience. We're learning from the, the plan that God really worked out in him. And, and I'm going to tell you, everyone who, who teaches through Joseph's life, they come to the spot that we find ourselves today, and they've got to ask themselves a question about which details they really feel like we, we are you know, necessary for us to talk about. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, with Joseph, we, where, where we, we left him in, in the end of Genesis chapter 37, he, his brothers, they were jealous of him. They, they were jealous of his father's favoritism. They were jealous that God was giving him these dreams where he was going to be elevated above them, and, and, and they wanted to murder him. And then when they decided not to do that, they decided that they were going to sell him as a slave and so we, as the, as the onlookers, we're, we're, we're hearing about Joseph's story, and we're like, I, whew, like we're, we really want to know, like, what's, what's going to happen with, with Joseph next? But then that's not where the Bible takes us, at least not yet. Like, instead, we find ourselves in, in Genesis chapter 38, and, and, and we have to decide, wow, is this, uh, is this something that we're going to talk about, or are we just going to skip ahead? And, and, and honestly, a lot of times, whenever we, we're talking about or teaching through the story of Joseph, we will skip chapter 38 and just go straight to chapter 39. For, for starters, Joseph is not even mentioned in Genesis 38. And so it's, it's kind of reasonable to say, okay, yeah, you know, if we're just trying to get the details of Joseph's life, we don't really need to, we don't really, really need to read about this. And, but it's also that Genesis, uh, Genesis 38 is, it's one of the more embarrassing chapters, and I'm not just talking about in the book of Genesis, I mean in the whole Bible. So whenever we look at this, it, it, it feels a little bit like it's an, a bit of an intermission from Joseph's story, and it's, and it's very scandalous, and so it's not hard to just say, nah, you know, we'll just, we'll just skirt past this one and head on to, head on to Genesis 39. We're not going to do that this morning. And, and, and the reason is that as, as, as dicey as, as Genesis 38 can, can be, it's also, it's also very important to to Joseph's overall story. You see, what happens in Genesis 38 really lays the groundwork for his, his family's eventual comeback you know, from all of this horrible stuff that they've done to him. But even more than that, Genesis 38, it's, it's a small, but it's, it's an important part of the Bible's big story. The one that's the one that's pointing us all along to Jesus. And here at Sarasota Christian Church, our mission, and, and I hope you get tired of hearing me say this, our mission is we are pursuing Jesus as he transforms lives. We believe that 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 going after Jesus, that getting to know Jesus better is going to ultimately make us better. And so we're gonna we're gonna pursue him and we're gonna pursue him in scripture, even in the tough places. Because whenever we get to better know this, this man's history, whenever we get to better know his heart, we, we just fall in love with following him more. So we're, we're going to go down the rabbit hole a little bit today. Genesis 38. All right, so, so Joseph. We've talked about Joseph as being one of 12 brothers. Well, Genesis 38 follows the story of just one of those brothers, Judah. Now Judah, we uh, up until Genesis chapter 37, we didn't know a whole lot about Judah. He was just one in a list of 
of names. He was one of Jacob's sons. He was one of Joseph's brothers. But then we get introduced to him properly in in Genesis 37 because we hear him speak for the first time. Judah is actually the one who suggests to his brothers that, hey, instead of murdering him, what if we sold him? Yeah, J- J- Judah is the one who, who had this, this brilliant idea, who's like, you know what, instead of, um, in, instead of, instead of killing Joseph, let's just, let's just send our problem away. Like, let's just send him away, and then, then we don't have to worry about it, and then, and then we don't have the, the guilt in, in our conscience, you know, of having, of having killed our brother, and we don't have to deal with that, and oh, hey, yeah, yeah, we can, we can make, a, make, a little, make a little cash money in the process. <laughs> That's Judah. <laughs> this, this, this is our introduction to him. And so then it tells us in Genesis 38 that after that, he, he goes off on his own, and he gets, he gets married, and he has three sons, and their names are Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And that's where we pick it up with him in Genesis 38, verse 6. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Tamar. Now, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. That sounds kind of (laughs) harsh. But if we're, I mean, it, it, if we look at it, we, we see God put up with a lot of bad from a lot of people throughout the Bible. So if, if, if Ur, I mean, for someone to be doing something, to be something that is so, so wicked that it goes out of its way to tell us, and God decided that we just needed to bring this to an end, I'm not feeling quite as bad for Ur as as I'm feeling maybe for Tamar. I mean, poor Tamar, getting stuck with a guy like this. Well, it goes on. It says, then Judah said to Onan, this is his second son, said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife. Perform your duty as her brother-in-law and produce offspring for your brother. Now, we can't can't just read a verse like that and not have— to have at least a little bit of a conversation about differences in culture and customs. Um, I brought along a picture. These, these are mealworms. This is the first insect that I was ever offered to eat. Th- th- it turns out that they're actually a nice, crunchy source of protein whenever you bake them. And in, in a number of different cultures, me saying that to you w- would be perfectly normal. But in our culture... You know the look that just went across your face when I said that. (laughs) At times, we are reading scripture, like in the verse that we just read, and um, we come across something that culturally is very different from what we would experience. We, in our culture, would have no expectation that a brother would sleep with his sister-in-law after the death of his sibling. We would look at that not as a duty. uh, We would probably look at that as something downright inappropriate. (laughs) We've got to think of something like this. When we come across any customs like this in the Bible, we've got to look at them from from their cultural perspective and not ours. You see, in their culture, lines of inheritance were incredibly important. This is why we see that there are there are some women in Scripture who are women who are uh, valued, who are elevated because they give birth to sons, and there are others who who suffer really emotional agony because they can't have kids. Also, in their day and age, the the life expectancy was just shorter than it is today. It was more likely that that you might have a sibling who would who would pass away during their childbearing years. So we take those, those things together, the, the value of inheritors and, and, and a, a lower life expectancy, and, and you come up with a cultural custom where an offspring, or excuse me, where a, where a sibling might step in to help provide offspring for a, a departed family member. So we got Judah's son, Ur. Judah's son, Ur, was his primary heir. <laughs> 
and, and, and as his wife, Tamar, she's got the, she's got the right to, to be the mother of that child, to, to bear the heir for this family. And, and Tamar's right to that, it didn't go away just because her husband had died. So Judah says to the, the second-born son, Onan, he says, it's now your responsibility to provide your brother with an offspring. But the, the problem with this for Onan was that this wasn't going to be his kid. Like, even if it was his child biologically, it, it didn't count as his child. And even a step further than that, by helping to provide an offspring for his brother, what Onan would be doing would be assuring himself of not being his father's primary inheritor. And that's what Judah's asking him to do. He says, I need you to go make sure that your brother's family inherits twice as much as you do. Which is why Onan does what he does in verse 9. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, and so he put him to death also. This, this is a verse that makes us blush, and so we, are, we, can be, we can be eager to sort of speed past it. We've got to think of the gravity of this for a second, church. I mean, Onan, he, he, didn't, he didn't refuse to sleep with Tamar. He, that, would have, that would have been a dishonorable thing to do culturally, to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to, to ensure that my, my brother has an offspring. What Onan did was worse. Onan agreed to sleep with Tamar, under the false pretense of trying to help her have a baby for his brother, even though he had no intention of doing so. This is sexual assault. And, and whatever it is that, <laughs> that his brother Ur had done, God decided that this violation was worthy of the same result. And, and then we've got Tamar here. Tamar is now a victim twice over. First of a wicked husband and then of his abusive brother. And father-in-law Judah is about to make it a hat trick. It says, then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son, Shelah, grows up. For he thought... He might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. In other words, Judah pulls a move that is very similar to one that he perpetrated on his brother Joseph. He says, let's just send the problem away. I mean, in, in Judah's mind... He, he's, got, he's got Tamar, and she's the common denominator between his two sons that are dead, not, not thinking that maybe their own wickedness brought this upon themselves. Tamar's the victim here. And, and Judah says, well, we're just going to get rid of her. So rather than fulfilling his duty to her as a father-in-law to take care of her, to provide for her family, just like he had a duty to his brother Joseph. He says, let's just get rid of her. But he doesn't even say she can go and she's free of her family obligation. She can go find a new family to be a part of. No, she has to stay a widow. She's going to go be her father's problem. She's going to stay in her husbandless, childless widowhood, and she's just going to live in that state. And yeah, sure, he gives, he gives a little bit of lip service to, oh, whenever my other son grows up, I'll give, I'll give him, him her. And, but he he, we see here in just a second that he had no intention of keeping his promise. So this becomes the next 10, the next 15. I, we don't know how long years of Tamar life. Abused, cast aside, I mean, robbed of justice. 
want us to be here with her for just a minute. Some of, some of us in the room know what it feels like when, when, we, when we feel like the worst things that have ever happened to us just cast a shadow over the rest of our lives. When we've been abused, when we've been abandoned, when we've been mistreated, and then we're, when we've experienced some kind of devastating loss, and then we're just stuck there. And it does, it just shadows everything else moving forward. And maybe it's weeks, maybe it's months, maybe it's years that we're just stuck there. <laughs> we, and, and we try to move on and we can't. And we, we try to see something good come out of it, but we just can't see it. If you're listening today, just before we keep going with the story, I just want you to hear this. Maybe you need to hear this. This is Psalm 34, verse 18. It says that the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. If, if any part of your story resonates with Tamar's story, God is near us. I hope hope that we are able to give you some hope for that by the time we're done today. So what happens is that we're told that after, after a long time, Judah's, Judah, the father-in-law, his wife passes away. And so then we pick up the story in verse 13. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. And so she took off her widow's clothes, she veiled her face, she covered herself, and she sat at the entrance to Enam, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that though Shela had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. And he went over to her and said, come. Let me sleep with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. I would certainly hope not. Can we, can we just acknowledge this is a really weird story for Father's Day? Like, just, God in his timing is weird. <laughs> and so she said, what will you give me for sleeping with me? They entered negotiations. I will send you a young goat from my flock, he replied. But she said, only if you leave something with me until you send it. I need some kind of collateral here for this. What should I give you, he asked. And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. This is like the ancient world equivalent of, I would like your driver's license and registration. Like, I want something by which we can identify you. So he gave them to her, and he slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. She got up and left, and then removed her veil, and she put her widow's clothes back on. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Ajulamite in order to get back the items that he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He asked the men of the place, where's the cult prostitute who was beside the road at Inam? There's been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Adulamite returned to Judah saying, I couldn't find her. And besides, the men of the place said, there has been no cult prostitute here. Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself. Otherwise, we will become a la laughingstock. We're going to be walking around with this little goat saying, hey, we're looking for a prostitute. We're looking to pay somebody here. After all, I did send this young goat, but you couldn't find her. After three months, or about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has been acting like a prostitute, and now she is pregnant. <laughs> Church, that's, that's supposed to be a statement of irony. <laughs> like, 
Whoever, whoever the, the moral police was who came to tell Judah, hey, Tamar had been sleeping with someone, clearly because she's pregnant now, they used the phrase, she's been acting like a prostitute, not realizing that that's exactly what she had been doing, and that Judah had been the one who had been a part of this whole thing. And then so Judah says, well, bring her out and let her be burned to death. Oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have some moral outrage here. We got zero tolerance for this kind of immoral behavior under my household. Makes the blood boil, doesn't it? They, I, he, he, he was the guy. He, he says, okay, it's okay for, for me to get away with this, but if my daughter-in-law, who has been, who's been stuck in this, in this trapped, unjust position, if she does something like this, well, she's going down. And as she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. This is the best. (laughs) I am pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? I just want to have queued up like a cricket sound effect. Judah recognizes him, and he said, she is more right than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shelah, and he did not know her intimately again. This is just like 90s daytime talk show stuff, isn't it? I didn't get pregnant by my two brother husbands, but now I'm having a baby with my father-in-law. And it's terrible. And we've got got Tamar, this, this wronged woman who has just been trapped and who is clawing for justice. And and church, hear this. I know that this sounds weird to us. She had every right to have a baby with the next of kin of her dead husband. Tamar Tamar wasn't in the wrong here. We've got Judah, who just seems to be be doing the same, making the same wrong decisions over and over again. I'm just going to get my problems away from me. And then you stack onto it just this horrible hypocrisy. You ever feel like you are just completely sunk by your worst moments? I mean, I'm talking about the worst things that have ever happened to you. Maybe even just the guilt over the worst things that you've ever done. The truth is that all of us, we come before God. A little bit like Tamar. Having been hurt, having been mistreated. We all come to God a little bit like Judah. We've just done the wrong thing over and over again. I want to tell you very clearly what this story really just implies to us. And that's that God is in the redemption business. You see, the story just ends kind of abruptly. So I think it would help to hear just some of the redemption that God ends up bringing to this story. You know, Tamar, she she gets pregnant by her her father-in-law, Judah. She she ends up becoming pregnant, and she gives birth to a son named Perez. And and this was the this became the heir to Judah's family. This was the heir that she had the right to. To mother and and through Judah and through Perez, this this line became a whole became a whole tribe of people of, of the people, the nation of of Israel, and, and it was through Judah's line that actually came the line of kings. Tamar, she she went through these 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 decades of just of just shame and hurt and having to go to these extremes, but God brought about in her family was that she was the great great grandmother of kings. We even know more, by the grace of God, we get to know more of the story 
We're going to see millennia later a, a man named Matthew. He would write another book of the Bible. And this book of the Bible would be all about Jesus. It would be all about his life, about his ministry, how he was the son of God. He came to redeem us, how, how he, was, he, he died on a cross and how he came back to life covering all of our, our wrongs and our, and, and our sins. And, and Matthew, he opens his book with a, a, a family line, with a genealogy of, of Jesus. But he does something that, that ancient writers just did not do whenever they were writing these kind of family histories. He includes the name of the names of you know, five women. And, and maybe those of us who kind of know our Bible a little bit, maybe we would expect him to include, you know, Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel. Maybe we would expect him to include Abraham's wife, Sarah, but it's not her. Maybe we would think he would include, you know, Isaac and, uh, and his wife, Rebecca, but it's not Rebecca. It's not, it's not Leah or Rachel, who we heard about a couple of weeks ago. It's him. She is lifted up as this woman whose, whose legacy is worth remembering after all of this messy affair. I mean, we, in, in God's story for Tamar, there is, there's hope. There is hope for those who have been abused and those who have been abandoned and those who have been mistreated. It may take a long time, but God's in the redemption business. And you know, for Judah, for Judah, it, it, seems, it seems like a light bulb finally clicks for Judah here. I mean, this moment, whenever Tamar confronts him with his injustice, whenever she confronts him with his hypocrisy. It's like something finally breaks through for him. Because we're going to see Judah again in this series. But the man we see is a different man. He's different from the brother who thought it would be a good idea to sell Joseph as a slave. He experiences some change of heart, and that change of heart helps lead to no less than this family's own redemption story. It leads to their comeback. In God's story for, for Judah, there is hope. There is hope for the abandoners. There's hope for the hypocrites. There's hope for the selfish. Church, I would tell you that we can... We can let our worst moments define us. Or we can let Jesus redeem us. I mean, what Judah and Tamar, what they didn't know as they were going through the story, but, but we get the benefit of, of seeing is how God was at work in their story. I mean, through all of this mess, how God was using it, ultimately bringing about, uh, bringing about the, the line of, of Jesus himself and and it is the message of Jesus that we don't have to be defined by our worst decisions we don't have to be defined by the evil things that have been done to us like we don't have to stay stuck there by the grace of Jesus when we turn to him when we bring our past when we we lay it before Jesus and say I want to follow you what we get from that, we, we get this trust that, that God is working. And even if it's been years, even if it's been decades since we've been hurt or since we've done wrong, we can trust that God is doing something with it. When, when we come to, to Jesus and we bring maybe this, this guilt that we have just been, been wearing for the things that we have done in our past, we, can, we get to lay that down in front of him. We don't have to carry it anymore because he says it's covered by my grace. You know, ever since I ever since I heard it, I've I've just I, I love the story of of Charles Colson. Chuck Colson was uh, the a special counsel to President Richard Nixon. He was, uh, in his own words, he was valuable to the president because he was willing to be ruthless to get things done. Okay. Colson was known as Nixon's hatchet man. He was the guy that the president would call in whenever there was a person or whenever there were a group of people who were making it hard for him to get done what he needed to get done. And Colson would, he would do and say and write what needed to be done to take those people down. Colson was 
one of the people who would ultimately serve time in prison for the Watergate scandal that got Nixon um, to resign from office. Well, whenever he was, whenever he was facing arrest and, and trial, a friend introduced Chuck Colson to Jesus. I mean, really introduced him to Jesus. And Colson became a Christian. And there were people at the time who said, well, you know, he's just, he's just doing this uh, for, for lenience. He just wants to get a little bit of a lighter sentence, so he's acting like he's had this big life change. But Colson, actually, after prayer and, and, and counseling with other believers, he decided to plead guilty to a crime that he knew he'd committed, and he went to prison. And it was in prison that he started to see some of the injustices of that system. And, and so whenever he got out, he, he started a ministry that would minister to prisoners and to ex-prisoners and to their families, all the while trying to, to advocate for some reform in the prison system and, and better rehabilitation processes for prisoners. Today, Prison Fellowship, that ministry that he founded, is the largest Christian nonprofit organization that serves prisoners and their families. And, and Charles Colson continued to be just a faithful voice for Jesus, really for the rest of his life. God's in the redemption business. And maybe it sounds like it's too easy. Maybe if we're wearing some kind of weight, a, a, a Tamar-like weight of the hurt that's been done to us, a Judah-like weight of the hurt that we've done, maybe it sounds Maybe it sounds like turning to Jesus is just a little bit too simple. That's why it's called good news. Because everything that you need to be redeemed from what has happened in your past, it has been taken care of for you by Jesus on the cross. It, it, I'm not saying that becoming a follower of Jesus is easy, but it's not complicated. God wants to... God wants to show you that he can make something incredible of your past and he wants to give you an incredible hope for the future church i don't know maybe there's maybe there's someone who is listening here now and and you haven't you haven't ever made a decision to follow jesus you've never said i want to place my trust in him i want to put this weight that i have been carrying i want to put it down and experience what better he has for me Maybe there are some of us here in the room who we, we are followers of Jesus and, and we wouldn't, it's not like we want to not be pursuing Jesus, but there is some weight that we are carrying and in spite of saying we want to follow Jesus, we haven't been able to put it down. Or life has done something to us since we first met Jesus and we picked that up and now it is just, it is just weighing on us. Church, if that's, if that's you, I want more than anything else, I want for you to experience the gospel afresh today. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask for, for just a little bit of vulnerability as we, as we wrap up this morning. Just a little bit. If that's your story, I want to pray for you. And, and so I'm going to ask this. If, if you are one who feels like you've got things in your past that are still casting a shadow over your life right now. They can be things that were done to you, hurts that were perpetrated on you. They can be wrong things that you've done, or maybe even habits of wrong things that you have done. But if you have those things that are casting a shadow over your life and not letting you move forward in life, would you stand and let us pray for you? Nobody needs to know what those things are. Nobody needs to know it, what it is that's happened in your past. Nobody's going to walk up to you after the fact and say, hey, what was the reason you were standing up? That's not going to happen. But if that's a part of your story, I would be honored if you would stand so that we can just reach out a hand towards you as a church family and pray for you. Father God, just we love you lord and god there is there's so much to to learn by reading the stories from scripture because they are not clean and tidy they are a mess 
They are people who had their lives wrecked by others. They are people who made a wreck of their own lives. And yet, God, you redeem again and again and again. And we have brothers and sisters who are with us here right now, who are, who are bearing a weight, who have a shadow over their lives because of hurt, because of wrong, because of whatever it is in their past. And God, I just want to pray the gospel over them right now. I just pray, Lord, that you, in doing what only you can do, Lord God, would take that weight off of them, would wipe that shadow away, that they would know that they can walk in freedom away from it because of you, Jesus, because of what you did on the cross, because, God, you are a redeeming God. I pray that they would walk forward in trust, Lord God, trusting that, that you can make something of it. And it may take time, it may take decades, Lord, but that you are working things out for your good and glorious purposes. God, I pray that they would walk forward without guilt and without shame. If they have, if they have been living in just a, a guilt of having done wrong, Lord God, I pray that they would know that that has been covered by the cross. And that we would walk out of here freed people because of you, Lord Jesus. ask these things in your great name. Amen. You can have a seat. Church, we're going we're gonna to move into a time of communion, a time where we recognize the Lord's Supper together, and this is a regular reminder that we have that the death of Jesus on that cross, that it covers us, that we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice to remind us of his body and blood, that those accomplished everything that we need to be redeemed. There is nothing that has been done to us that God cannot use for his purpose. There is nothing that we have done that we have to continue to walk in. Thanks be to the cross of Jesus Christ. We're going to take time to thank him now.